All righty. Well, thank you all for coming today. My name is Michaela Kniffel. I am the visit coordinator for the Office of Admissions and Recruitment. Um, my job today is to really coordinate just the Zoom meeting. So if you have any questions logistically, I'm happy to help you out. Um, feel free to private message me. Um, but also, more importantly, we have our lovely Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships here who's going to present with you all. Um, and they'll introduce themselves shortly. But we have a great almost 30 to 45 minute presentation for you all to kind of get your answers to help hopefully move you in the forward steps. Um, so I'm gonna let them introduce themselves and then they'll do some screen share, but I always want you to welcome um, to add any questions into the chat at any point in time. Um, feel free to add those in directly to myself. We also have Melissa Vogler um, and Katie Hansen as well in the room. So feel free to private message if you feel the need to. Um, but we wanna make sure that you guys walk away with as many resources as possible. That's the purpose of today. We wanna make sure that you feel comfortable um, with your aid offer or anything in general, they'll kind of highlight in other ways to get in contact as well. So with that, I'm going to let Katie start off with her introduction, and then they'll take the ropes from here. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Hansen. I'm a financial aid advisor here at UW-Stevens Point. Um, I'm going to be giving the presentation today. Melissa's going to make me a co-host so I can screen share. That's important. <laughs> and then um, both Melissa and I will be here through the whole presentation to help answer questions. Uh, but we're going to be covering a lot of information, and we're just here to help you out through the whole process. And I'll let Melissa introduce herself next. Thanks. I'm trying to figure out how to make you a co-host first. <laughs> I'm Melissa Vogler, and I'm the Associate Director of Financial Aid and Scholarships. And my job today is to help address any questions you might have and to help Katie with the chat. When we're all finished, if you have any questions, put them in the chat area. And um, at the end, we'll go through them all and we'll answer them for you. Okay, great. So financial aid offer. I, how many of you got that in the mail already? Remember that thick packet, lots of information, lots of really useful stuff in there. Might be a little intimidating, might not all make sense. And that's part of the reason why you're, you came here today is to help us or for us to help you figure out what all of that information means. Uh, so I think what, oh yeah, I have some people responding in the chat that, yep, you received that. We'll also go over today, um, if you didn't receive one yet, why you may not have received one, and then what you should do in order to uh, um, help out with that. So, okay, I will share my screen and we'll get started on this presentation. Okay, everybody can see the big yellow screen? Yep. Great, okay. So this is a part of the FATS webinar series. What, how do I read my aid offer and what is next? These are some expected questions that I think some of you have, some parents, some students are wondering these things and we will answer these questions through this presentation. Is this my bill? I received my financial aid offer, now what? What if I haven't received a financial aid offer? What do I do if I receive a scholarship? Well, first celebrate and pat yourself on the back, um, but we'll get into more details than that. And what if my financial aid situation has changed and our uh, financial situation has changed and what if I haven't filled out the FAFSA yet? So we'll, we'll go through all of these. So this is kind of what maybe your first two pages looked like. Uh, as I said at the beginning, there is a lot on here. It's really valuable information, but it can be overwhelming and we, we know that. Um, this letter is addressed to Stevie Pointer, our, our mascot at UW Stevens Point. Uh, <laughs> so that's fun. First question, is this my bill? The short answer is no, this is not your bill. Um, so that's hopefully a relief to people who were maybe got a little sticker shock by that, that whole number. Um, our office, the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships put together a budget for how much it might cost the average student to attend college, you know, direct costs from the university and indirect personal expense type things. Um, this budget, known as the cost of attendance, includes expenses charged by the university and other expenses most students have throughout the year. This document that we mailed uh, lays out that budget, which is used to determine your award 
and then shows what financial aid is offered to help cover those expenses. So uh, what we have here then is um, some more details about that first letter. So this is a welcome letter from our director, Mandy Solinsky. Um, it, it covers that your financial aid is based off of your quote unquote expected family contribution. Uh, and this is information that's calculated based on what was on your FAFSA. So the EFC is a number that we get from a formula using data from the FAFSA. Um, it's the 2021 FAFSA because this, we're talking about schools starting this fall and it used 2019 income information to help determine that. It also shows the bullet points of what's included in the whole packet, um, as well as reminding you that that cost of attendance, that budget is an estimated cost. The back side, again, there's a lot on here. Um, the top is pretty easy. That's your name would be your name on there. And then your campus ID. This is a good number to memorize. Um, some people call it a student ID, campus ID. Uh, this will be your number that you'll refer to throughout your college career here. Um, I doubt yours is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, but lucky Stevie has that uh, <laughs> easy to remember number. Um, and then this offer is broken down below into different things. So we have first what's being offered as grants and scholarships. So the, the grants and scholarships here do not need to be paid back. So anytime you can have a grant or a scholarship, we mark that as yes, the student's going to accept this. So we have already accepted as the financial aid office, we have already accepted all the grants and scholarships on your behalf. Um, what's below that is loans that are offered. Um, since loans you do have to pay back, we do not accept that on your behalf. Those are for you to decide if you, to talk with your family and decide if you want to take out your, take out a loan to fund your um, education. You'll most, if you have financial need, um, you'll have a subsidized loan and an unsubsidized loan. Uh, if you only need some of that money, if you don't need all of the loans that are offered, take the subsidized first. Reason being, while you're enrolled, at least half time uh, going to school, uh, you aren't accruing interest on that loan. The unsubsidized loan also has a very good rate, very good uh, benefits to using that to fund your experience, but it does accrue interest while you are enrolled. So if you only need one of the two loans, take the subsidized first. And then below that, there is options for employment. So Stevie here has an offer of $2,000 for federal work study. Uh, as a note, there are jobs on campus that you need to have work study in order to have that specific job. Like if you wanted to be an office assistant in our office, we, we only have students who have been offered work study. But there are lots of jobs on campus that don't require work study funds. So even if you have not been offered work study, you can still have a job on campus. There's lots of different choices for that. And then over on the right, to the right of the employment section is the, uh, the other, other additional loans required, uh, or if you need them, they're available to apply for. So you'll see that those say separate application required. So we have that marked down as zero dollars because um, at this point, I don't think anybody has applied for an additional loan for this next year yet, uh, but we do have the Federal Direct Plus and private loan options. And I know there was at least one person asking earlier about these specifically uh, and how that works with our school. So we have a page on our website and at the end of the presentation, I can help navigate to that specific part of our website to show you where to find information about all of our loans. Uh, and we're, we're more than happy to help walk you through the process on applying for either the, the federal direct plus or a private educational loan. So that's a breakdown first of the top section. That's the aid. Um, so it's a mix of aid, the grants and scholarships. As I said, that's gift aid. You don't have to pay back loans and employment. That's self-help aid, meaning you, the loans you would have to pay back and employment as you work and then you receive that money. 
And so that's not paid out as a lump sum, that, that $2,000 federal work study. That is set aside in an account that as you work your job and you get your biweekly check, that gets paid to the student to help with expenses. Below that is the cost of attendance section. And this might have been part of that sticker shock sec you know, section that if you were reading through these numbers, um, it's broken out by semester, fall, spring total. And these are not charges. This is a budget we've created that should cover 99% of the students here. That uh, tuition and fees, unless the student's taking classes that have a lot of extra fees, um, you know, sometimes, like when I went to college, I was in a couple art classes where we had course fees where the professor would buy a bunch of paint that we all got to use uh, and we all chipped in 20 bucks as a course fee to help cover that cost, stuff like that. Um, so it's possible that, that you might be up to that full $4,202 as tuition and fees for a semester, but it's, it's more likely that your actual charges will be less than that. Same with the housing and meals. This housing is and the way it's budgeted right now is for a student who is living on campus. So this will cover um, the housing on campus as well as meal plans. Um, that number may vary then also if you have a more expensive, if you're living in the apartments on campus, it's more expensive than the residence halls, or if you have a really expensive meal plan or a base meal plan, that number can vary then on your bill. But this budget should cover um, most students, as I said. And those are the, the direct costs then that would be charged to the student, tuition and fees, housing and meals. That will be on the, the bill that comes out in August. Uh, what we're showing here is that after the aid pays out, uh, so just the gift aid, that's the first yellow line down, uh, there's only 1,124 left to cover potentially out of pocket, um, but with the loan, the loan covers that. Uh, for the, the direct costs. For um, the indirect costs, so we estimated indirect costs. This is again still part of our cost of attendance. We figure that all students may have to buy extra books. Uh, UW Stevens Point has a very robust book rental program that's covered by the fees that in the tuition and fees section. So the text rentals for your general educations will be covered with the fees section of that. But you may have a couple of classes where the professor wants you to buy just th this book or that book um, or different school supplies. So that 125 is set aside to help pay for that. Um, same with transportation, some students have drive home every month, um, live, you know, live half hour from campus and drive to class every day, uh, that sort of thing. So the $645 budgeted allows students to take out financial aid to help cover those costs. And same with personal expenses. We know that students may need to replace a, a winter jacket, might need to might need to go out to the movies. Well, once theaters are fully open again and all that, uh, you know, these these funds are set aside and, and set up so that a student can be successful. Uh, so that's why uh, the numbers are the way they are. This is not what you're actually going to be charged, but this allows you to take financial aid out to cover this. Um, you're not required to take out loans to cover personal expenses. You can definitely pay out of pocket and not take out a loan for that. In fact, I recommend not taking out a loan if you can pay out of pocket for personal expenses. But for students who maybe they're a student athlete uh, and are taking 18 credits and something else is going on in their life and they can't have a job at the same time as everything else and they just want to use financial aid to pay for everything, that's fine. That's, that's what we're here for, um, to help get the bills paid and uh, help you be successful in school. So that's the, the direct costs, bills billed from the university, indirect costs, other expenses students have throughout the year. And then at the very bottom of the page, you'll see that the financial aid offer is based off these data points. So for example, this student is going to the Stevens Point campus um, versus the WASA or the Marshfield campuses. Residency, it says resident because they are a Wisconsin resident. So they're being charged the, the Wisconsin rate for tuition. Um, their EFC, their expected family contribution is zero. So when Stevie Pointer's family filled out their FAFSA, 
when they sent the data through the federal formula, the EFC came back as zero. And then the housing for Stevie Pointer is on campus. So we budgeted enough money in the housing line to cover living on campus. A lot of good information on there. So I know many of you are in this position right now. I received my financial aid offer, now what? Well, I know you've got a lot of things going on with probably finishing up your own, like, if you're a senior in high school, you have a lot of stuff going on there. A um, lot of other things on campus competing for your attention. That's all well and good. Um, but for financial aid purposes, we highly recommend that you monitor your access point account and your UWSP email for updates and tasks that are, uh, that might be assigned as needed. So uh, if you are somebody who chooses to take out a loan, you'll need to do these three things. Uh, there is an annual student loan acknowledgement. And so that means you'll do it this year and the next year and the next year, every year that you take out a loan. Um, and Melissa, do you know if it's every year they take out a loan or every year that they still have a loan? Every year that they take out a loan, they have to acknowledge it. The loan indebtedness that they have in the future as well as what those payments might be. Thank you. And then there's also entrance loan counseling at studentaid.gov and the direct loan master promissory note at studentaid.gov. You'll need that same um, FSA ID, your federal student aid ID that you created when you filled out the FAFSA. You'll need to log in using that. I think it's really important for the student to do this. It should be the student doing this. I know a lot, know a lot of parents like to help out. Um, the entrance counseling, it, it takes a little bit of time to do it. It's going to ask for um, an estimate of how much in loans you're going to take out, what the interest rate is going to be, have you guess what your job is going to be after college, how much you're going to make. Those are, are can be hard things to know, but a good guess, a good estimate will help you sh help explain to you how your bills, your, your loan bills after college might look like. So, um, if you feel like you're not quite sure on an answer, just your best guess for the entrance counseling is fine. Um, many people by this stage in life ha know lots about loans, uh, but this is kind of an equalizer for anybody who doesn't know anything about loans uh, to make sure that they know what they're getting into. And then the master promissory note is going to ask for some, con in addition to a note promising to pay it back, it's going to ask for information about people who can get a hold of you in case, um, you know, sometimes you get a job opportunity right out of college, move to California, forget to tell your loan servicer that you moved or something like that. Um, after college, when you're working on repaying back your loans, you'll work with your loan servicer, and they are wonderful people who are very dedicated to making sure that you know how your loans work and help you find a plan, a repayment plan that works for you. Uh, so it's important that they can get a hold of you so they can keep you from going into default um, and help keep you from um, hurting your credit score. So they want to always try to find a way to, you know, catch you before you, like, even if you've already missed a payment, call them right away, get, get back on track and they, they'll, they're there to help you. So I know that's, hopefully years off from now. Um, if you're going into a, a bachelor's program, that's probably about four years from now until you have to worry about that uh, until the repayment part, but um, it's just good to know. Uh, so when you do these tasks online, they're not gonna show as completed on access point until we originate the loan mid-August. So um, it's, it's done on the government website. We load the data from the government website when we go to originate the loan. So even if it shows as initiated on the to-do list, on the task list, it's okay. Um, we'll, we'll load that file later. And then our financial aid will begin applying to student bills about 10 days prior to the start of the semester. So that's what to expect for regarding financial aid if you've received your offer. If you haven't received your financial aid offer, uh, first confirm that you've completed a FAFSA. It's not too late. You wanna make sure that UWSP is listed as a school to receive this data. And our school code is 003924. Uh, it's possible that when you were uh, filled out the FAFSA, you didn't have us on your list originally. It's okay. You can log back in and put our number in the list um, and we'll, we'll load that data then. 
And then again, you'll want to keep reviewing your access point account and your UWSP email for any updates or tasks that are assigned. And if we request any documents, send them as soon as possible so we can take a look at them and make sure you're ready to go with your financial aid. So we're going to watch a video next of how to accept loans. Um, if you are looking for this video by yourself later, it's on when you go to access point before you log in, under the login information, there's an access point help link. And then this video and several others are all um, shown right there. But this is the video for that. So if you need to see it again, you can find it by looking at the access point help, which is a link under the login information for access point. I don't know if we're able to hear or see the video if it is playing. Was that you're, you're not able to actually hear the video? Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you the I'll send the video to Michaela to send out to everyone afterwards. So um, yeah, this is a it, it's a helpful video, but we will go back to the presentation then. Um, it's not necessarily intuitional, the video, of or the, the how to accept the loans, um, but the video explains it very well. Thanks for letting me know. Uh, and just as a reminder that just because you, just when you accept the loan, you're not done yet, that you still have to do that loan acknowledgement, that entrance counseling and the master promissory note. So accepting the loans is the first part of it, but to actually receive the loans, you need to do these other things. Okay, but what about my bill? I know some of you are really wondering about this specifically. I told you that the loan or the financial aid offer is not the bill, um, but you will be receiving an email from Student Financial Services when the bill is available to view online. You will need your UWSP logon and password to access the e-bill. So the exact dates as of now have not been announced, but fall bills are Fall semester bills are typically issued in late August and are due approximately a month later. So um, that's a little idea. You can log on to Access Point and see what's been charged there so far. Uh, like if they'll, as you pick a meal plan, then they'll add it, uh, stuff like that. So, but it's not until that August bill where you have a real bill that needs to get paid. And you, as I said, it's about a month until that's due. Uh, we hear, we get calls all the time asking about bills. Uh, so it's really important to know that there's like two different offices that work really well together, uh, but we serve different functions. So I work in the financial aid office. We help students get money. And then there's student billing that's in student financial services and they take students money. So, you know, we're not necessarily the good guys and they're the bad guys. We just serve different functions on campus. Uh, so financial aid is ministered through our office. Uh, we help students fund their education through grants, scholarships, employment and loans, and we provide financial education. Student billing is run through Student Financial Services. Uh, they, they do the billing, work with the payment plans, they collect payments for tuition, other charges, they process financial aid refunds, and they also provide the 1098T tax information. And so here's contact information for their office if you ever need to get a hold of them. Otherwise, you can also search on our website, Student Billing or Student Financial Services, and you can find their, their website and they'll um, help you out. Okay, I think we might have a question. I, say, I do know we have some in the chat, which I know Melissa and I'm also taking some notes on what those are. So we'll make sure to touch those towards the end. But I think we have a raised hand by Jacob Cook. Feel free to unmic yourself if you'd like. If I raised my hand, it was by accident. Sorry. <laughs> That's, okay. That's okay. I just wanted to check. And now, now, Melissa, this was included in the packet, right? That was mailed out? 
or is it something they need to download from our website? This was included in the packet that was mailed out. Okay, thank you. In your award letter. Okay. So this is the cost comparison tool. I thought I'd maybe highlight this. You don't have to use it. You don't have to turn it in anywhere. It's not due. It's not actually, it's there to help you. It's not actually meant as like any kind of homework that you need to, to show us or anything. Um, but it, we thought it might be helpful for you to look at how much it costs to go to school here. And if you're looking at a couple other colleges, you can compare the co uh, college expenses and maybe have more of an apples to apples uh, comparison. So what you would do first is use the data from our financial aid offer to fill out that purple column and then uh, look for similar information from any other school that you're thinking about or if you've applied to or you're thinking about attending. And then you can get a sort of feeling for uh, what's after, after the financial aid is paid, what's your out-of-pocket cost? What's your net cost? What, what's the difference of what you're gonna have to come up with or, or how much are you gonna have to take out as loans to cover that dis difference? Um, sometimes you'll get a financial aid offer from a school where like, oh, their tuition's really high, but they gave me a really large scholarship. Yes, they gave you a large scholarship. They charged you $10,000 more, but then gave you a $9,000 scholarship. Is that really, a savings then? Like, are you really saving $9,000 if they're charging you that much more to begin with? Um, just something to, to be aware of. And we, we know that that's, you know, it's, it's wonderful. That's where you really want to go. And that's what's going to make it affordable to, for you to, to have the career you want. Um, but we want you to look at, you know, what is the bottom line also? Uh, what, how much, you know, we, we really try to limit loan indebtedness. Um, so anytime that we can help you from taking out a out alone if you don't have to, that's great. So hopefully you could find this tool helpful. Okay, so you might remember from that, that one page that it said grants and scholarships. So that's what we know of so far for you as a student. Uh, a lot of communities and schools are still doing scholarships right now for their high school seniors. So you might get scholarships that um, aren't reflected yet on your financial aid offer. That's okay. Uh, so as I said before, first celebrate, pat yourself on the back, awesome. Um, and then you'll also wanna report to us promptly, like as soon as you're able to without like, you know, the next minute, uh, that you've received the scholarship so that we're aware of um, that you'll having that thousand dollars at $500, whatever coming in so that we can adjust your financial aid offer to reflect that. Uh, and then we do have a form available um, and that's, that's the link to it there. Uh, or you can search scholarships and it's on the scholarships main page, this, the same link to the scholarships. Um, or yeah, that's the link to our scholarships page. So the scholarship outside resource reporting form and then that'll come in. And just as a reminder, we do highly recommend that students apply for any and every scholarship for which they may be eligible. Even if you think you're not eligible for it, apply for it anyway. And, and those little small scholarships do add up. So apply, apply, apply. Uh, some of you might also be in the situation right now, you don't have a financial aid offer because you haven't filled out the FAFSA yet. It's not too late. It's okay. Um, the application does open every year on October 1st for the next academic year. You'll want to make sure you have an FSA ID completed, and then you'll need to complete the FAFSA for the 2021-2022 school year. It's going to be asking for 2019 income information, and then you'll send to our school, um, school code 003924 and then monitor access point and UWSP email for any updates or tasks. So as you probably heard a couple times, we're using information from 2019, income information from 2019. A lot of families' financial situations have changed since then for a number of reasons. People retire, people quit jobs, COVID-19 happens. Uh, there's uh, some, some families have vastly changed their financial strength since 2019. So um, UW Stevens Point is one of the schools that does allow financial aid appeals where we uh, use updated information to rerun your financial aid. And if that new information helps you, helps you have a better financial aid offer, then we change your financial aid to, um, to have better, either better loans or grants. Um, 
the form opens every year mid-May. So right now the one on our website is for this current academic year for 2020-2021. Uh, so if you were to fill it out right now for next fall, it would get rejected and we'd ask you to refill it out um, mid-May when the form opens up. And then here, just some final resources uh, for our office and just helpful things to know. Um, we're, we're available by phone, email, uh, hopefully sometime again we'll be available in person, uh, but otherwise, you know, we're, we're, we're being safe and could do, we could do Zoom meetings and Skype or whatever works for students and families. Um, there's also our financial aid checklist to kind of stay on top of the financial aid tasks, our frequently asked questions in Grad Ready, which is our free online financial literacy tool. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing and we're going to uh, open this up to some questions. Well, I will start reading some of the questions that we've received. So beginning with this one, if it states zero for work study, does that mean that they didn't qualify for a work study award? If so, what allows you to qualify or not qualify for this? Oh, good question. Yes, so if it says zero, that means you've not been offered work study. Work study requires you to have what is considered financial need. And that is if you're after other need is, or after other, hmm, after other financial aid is assigned, if you still have room in your financial need, uh, then we can offer that. Meaning if your, EF, your EFC needs to be lower than that cost of attendance, and that's the difference for need. Um, so if you were interested in work study and you did have the need for it, but you, okay, this is going to get kind of complicated. If you have a low EFC and you, you put maybe on your FAFSA that you weren't interested on in work study, if there's room in your budget, we could possibly add it depending on how much work study funds we have. So that might be a good, good one to call our office with, and we can look at your specific situation. Anything to add, Melissa? The only thing I'd add is that even though you don't have federal work study, remember there are still plenty of jobs on campus so um, that are not federal work study and you don't need federal work study to work some of those jobs. Um, the other thing I'd mentioned about federal work study, the benefit to federal work study, um, a lot of times students come to campus and they're, they're, they have reservations about perhaps working a work study job. I would suggest to you um, to try it. Um, our, our state associations, national associations have done a lot of research on students who actually work in a federal work study job or on in an on-campus job while going to school. And they found that students who work between 10 and 15 hours a week actually do better than students who don't work at all. Um, additionally, um, you know, you network yourself. If, if a student's working in our office and they come to me and they say, hey, you know what, I'm having a lot of anxiety about school or I'm, I'm maybe, um, struggling in my math class. If they're struggling in the math class, I'd send them to the tutoring and learning center. If they're having some anxiety issues, I might send them to the counseling center. If they're struggling with bronchitis, I'd send them to the wellness, you know, to the health center. So, so by, by working on campus, you get to know another department. You also gain some really valuable career skills. So that's a little bit more about work study. I didn't mean to go too much into it, but um, if you have a federal work study job, take advantage of it. Next question is, um, on the Federal Direct Plus or pri private loan on the aid offer, does the school help me find the loan when I apply and then it does it give me options or do I have to go out and do this all on my own? Okay, good. I'm going to share my screen again to help talk through this answer. So let's get to this right here. Okay. So this is our UWSP Financial Aid and Scholarships homepage. You can see a lovely graphic of Old Main right here. Uh, in order to, to find out more about loans that we recommend, uh, I would go to the purple drop-down menus on the left here, and then types of aid, because loans, is, loans are a type of aid. Mm -hmm. And then that's the, the middle one right there, loans. Then we come to the all about the loans page and there's a lot of information on here. It can be kind of overwhelming again. Uh, so we have information about the private educational loan, or sorry, the federal educational loans. So that's the subsidized and the unsubsidized, what they are, what the interest rates are, loan limits. 
we keep scrolling down, scrolling down, scrolling down. We have information here about the Federal Parent Plus Direct Loan. And so that is applied for by the parent at studentaid.gov. Uh, and then there's information about um, the credit is approved or denied instantly. And then the, the results from that are transmitted to our office for us to process. So um, that's for the Parent PLUS loan. The interest rate is pretty good at the 5.3%. Uh, be aware that there's an origination fee of 4.236%. So that amount is taken off every time that loan is originated. So that's a, a bit of money that's taken off the top right away. Um, so you, you, this is a loan option. It, uh, it's, it would be in the parent's name and the parent's responsibility to pay it back. Uh, lots of families work it out that, you know, it's under mom's name, but little, little Frankie makes the payments on it. So um, whatever your family works out for that, but ultimately if you default or something, it, it's the parent who gets dinged. Um, below that, we have in information about the private educational loans. First, we recommend that you have a FAFSA on file, which you all, you will, most of you do. Um, and then I would work my way through Fast Choice, which is our online comparison tool. Uh, every lender that is within here, so I'm just gonna click through. So most of you will be an undergraduate student. You'll want to complete this borrowing essentials. I'm gonna say we already completed it for time's sake. Continue, okay, next. Read all the fine print though. Don't do what I'm doing. Um, and then this brings you to a list of uh, private lenders. And there's some names on here you'll recognize, maybe like UW Credit Union, Thrivent, Sally Mae, Discover. And there's some other things on here that I'd never heard of before I worked in financial aid. But these are all you know, legitimate, good private lenders. Uh, at this stage, you may also want to talk to your local bank uh, or local credit union to see if they also do private educational loans and what their rates would be. And um, you can use this then as a comparison to figure out what works well. And, and we work with all of these. So we have systems set up so that the funds come to our campus and then get paid out for your tuition and other charges. So is that answering the question, Melissa, or am I missing part of it? I think it is answering the question. Um, the, a follow-up is it, our private loans from the school. They get processed by the school, but they are not money lent to you from the school. Um, the other thing that I would mention about private loans on that, on that um, tool she just showed you, you can pick your, your favorite three and compare them and then you can stack them right next to each other and see which one is most beneficial to you. I don't know if you mentioned that, I might've missed it, sorry. Yeah, I don't, okay. I don't think I did, but it, it's nice that you can compare yep. those then. Yeah, it really is. Okay, another question, what is the cutoff to accept financial aid and what's the deadline for accepting or declining student loans? Oh, good questions. So they're, they're, ooh, I would say if you want your financial aid to pay out in time to pay your bill, you'll want to have it accepted um, before the bill is due, basically. Uh, for loans, uh, you have options to accept a loan, decline a loan, or reduce and accept a loan. So if you don't want the full amount offered, you can also reduce. Uh, I usually advise students that if they don't think they need the money, but they might later on, I would just have it sitting out there as offered. And then if something comes up through the school year where car breaks down, you need to buy supplies for a class, uh, you can then accept the loan at that time and then have that money originate and then come to you to help pay for those expenses. Um, if for some reason you decline your loans and you decide later that you actually do need that money back, you can call our office and we can put it back out there uh, on your financial aid offer for you to accept at that time. Same thing is if you accept just part of your loan and you decide later you want the full amount, we can go back and add on the difference as an offer. So the difference between what you've accepted and what you originally offered and put that out there for you to accept at that point. Um, what else would you say about that, Melissa? I would say that um, the deadline for accepting or declining your loans would probably be two weeks prior to the, to the end of your enrollment period. So if you're enrolled for fall and spring, um, we can process an academic year loan up until two weeks prior to the end of your enrollment. 
um, for that year. So probably May 1st-ish would be, you know, of, of 2022 20, for the 21-22 academic year. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing that I would mention is that um, um, with student loans, they take, like Katie mentioned in the presentation, that there's three things you need to do to get those loans. So if you're waiting and it gets to be about a week before bills are due, don't wait till just before bills are due because there's three other things you're gonna to need to do this first year as a first time borrower. You're gonna to have to do that master promissory note, you're gonna to have to do the entrance counseling and you're gonna to have to do that loan acknowledgement process. So in order to make sure that's all done and in our system and your loans are originated and dispersed, I'm gonna say at least allow two weeks before the due date of that loan and then really get through those other processes quick so that everything is in place so that the money's on your account by the due date because they will bill you an administrative fee and finance charges if your if your bill is not paid by the due date so that's just a little thing i'd, I'd mentioned about student loans next question katie is um do student do students starting fall of 2021 already have a UWSP email account? They should. Uh, I think Michaela probably knows more about this than I do, if Michaela wants to chime in. Yeah, definitely. So as soon as you are admitted to the university, you should have gotten a temp or your ID um, number was sent to you in an email from our information technology in a temporary passcode. Um, if you do not recognize, we get many times students don't see those emails. It looks like spam almost. Um, so I'm happy to resend those um, when I send the confirmation email. You can always send that to me. Um, but essentially, when you set up that temporary passcode, um, it'll trigger you to set up security questions. Um, you'll kind of create your account from there and then ultimately it will give you your username. Um, so to reference, if you've already logged into Access Point, you may already be using it and you don't realize it because um, your username is the same for all of your university platforms, whether it's Zoom in the future, um, Canvas to access your classes, your Access Point, um, it's going to be all the same. So typically it's the first initial of your first name, um, the first four initials of your last name, and then the final three digits of your ID number. So for example, for Stevie Pointer, it would be S for Stevie, and then P-O-I-N for Pointer, and then seven, oh wait, it would be six, seven, eight um, for that, and then at uwsp.edu. So um, I'm happy to send those emails to you if you're after this meeting and curious about what yours is, I'm happy to send those as well. Thanks, Michaela. Okay, um, if approved for the Wisconsin GI Bill, does that need to be reported to adjust the financial aid offer? Yeah, so you would want to work with Ann Whip uh, in the registrar's office, who is our veterans coordinator, and she's the best point of contact if you have questions about the GI Bill, how it works with um, getting that information to our campus. And then uh, I don't know what the processes actually are that happen, but I know that they still then up, show up in your financial aid and so it pays out towards your tuition and other um, other bills through the university. Do you know more about the processes or is that enough do you think Melissa? That, that's pretty good. Basi what happens is once and WIP approves your Wisconsin GI Bill and we find out what that award amount is we um, um, I, I I don't, we use suck it up through external awards, but we use, we do a process that brings it into our system and then updates your award. So if you know you're getting a different amount than what is on your award, when we do add it to your award, please contact us and let us know. I also added Ann Whip's email into the chat, just in case if someone wanted to reference that. Thanks, Michaela. Okay, um, where can we find the recording of this meeting or presentation for future reference? I'll be happy to answer that one. Um, that goes in, I was gonna put that in my conclusion message, but I will send a follow-up email to all of the participants, whether you attended or not. Um, and that will include the previous, the first, uh, or the past two, oh my goodness, the past fast webinars that we've already had. Um, they're just YouTube links that we have, so you can get access to any previous ones that you may have missed. Um, but then also the current, Reg or recording that we have as well. So I'll make sure to include those in the emails. Um, and then it'll also include a registration for any future FAST webinars if you wanna continue, because um, we have a couple more series after this. 
Okay. Um, let's see. When do we get told who our advisor is? I'm assuming that might be about an academic advisor. Um, so it kind of depends on when your enrollment term is. So I'm not, I'm assuming we have a lot of fall 2021 students in here. Um, so if you plan on coming in August, you will get some information about orientation. We call it STAR on our campus. Um, as early as like this coming month, we're gonna start releasing some of the information on that um, where you'll have orientation. However, a component of that is gonna be an advising session. We're gonna start students advising in May um, or it could be in June for you depending on appointments and so that will be an email um, eventually sent to your UW Stevens Point email so if you're already admitted if you've confirmed your acceptance um, we recommend already having your email on file so you're getting notifications um, but those advising appointments are going to start about May time um, you may get some emails early April to start planning that deadline. Um, and if you attend Admitted Student Day, you'll get early access to signing up for advising sessions. So that's another bonus plus there. Okay, thank you. Um, um, let's see, can you explain more about the EFC and what that number means? Yeah, absolutely. So EFC stands for Expected Family Contribution. And this is a number that is calculated by taking the information from the FAFSA. It's ran through the federal formula to figure out how much, basically how much financial strength does each family have? I have seen EFCs as low as zero, uh, all the way up to 999,999, 999, um, which usually that means there's some sort of error uh, <laughs> that <laughs> happened there and we, we take a look at those. Uh, so the expected family contribution really is what drives the kind of financial aid each student is eligible for. So if that number is less than our cost of attendance, so I'm gonna refer back to that sheet and let me share the screen real quick. So back to this page. So the total cost of attendance for the student, is this gonna go? Uh, total combined estimate and direct cost. So this 19,000, sorry, I clicked on it, uh, $19,386. So that's in the, the, the right column, all the way down under total, the combined estimated direct and indirect cost. So that's the cost of attendance. So it's a, that budget that we've came up with of what it might cost an average student to attend college campus uh, expenses on campus and off campus that much. So if your expected family contribution is less than $19,386, that means you do have some sort of financial need. And then we can offer need-based aid for up to that amount. So let's say your EFC, your expected family contribution was $17,000 386. So you had $2,000 worth of need because the calculated difference between how much it costs to go to school and how much your expected family contribution is. Then we can offer you $2,000 of need-based aid. Uh, at this point, it would be $2,000 as a subsidized loan. And then the rest of the loan would be unsubsidized because that would fill up um, your calculated need. Uh, students with a zero EFC like Stevie here, is eligible for then eligible for um, some grants like the Wisconsin grant, the the Pointer Partnership, the Pell, the Federal Pell Grant, the SEOG grant, um, and the, but if he had EFC, let's say of like a thousand, a little bit more, he would be still eligible for some of these, but they would be prorated down, so he would have smaller Wisconsin grant, smaller Pell grant. Um, still have probably the point of partnership and SGOG depending on those those cutoffs that year. Um, so that that's how that that kind of works. It's a kind of a sliding scale so that the 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 grants go mostly to students who have the most financial need and then students who have less financial need we still have aid available but it's more of the self-help kind of need. What else would you add to that Melissa? Only that the EFC is not an amount that you have to pay. It's it's really just an amount that um, we use to determine 
what your need is and that if, um, if it, most of the time, if you can't come up with that amount or if that amount, you know, isn't available to you, there are other loans that you can borrow to cover it, such as the PLUS loan. Um, but uh, as always, I'm always going to be about um, keeping your indebtedness at a minimum. So plan ahead um, as, as much as you can. Um, let's see, the next question is, um, where else do you recommend looking for scholarships? Mm, good question. I've been touching up our scholarships 101 presentation that we, we gave last month. So one thing I would say is look at the FAST uh, webinar from last month about scholarships 101. Uh, the website that I usually tell students to go to is FASTweb. Um, and then also look at scholarships in your community and from your high school. Uh, apply for anything and everything. So there's a couple of good uh, search engines out there for scholarships specifically. It wouldn't hurt to throw your hat in the ring on a couple of nationwide ones, but also think specific to you. Like, are there scholarships for students studying biology from your specific county? Maybe, and maybe you'll be the one student in the county who applies for that correctly, and then you'll get that scholarship. So think about you specifically as a student. Um, what are your experiences, your volunteer experiences, uh, your leadership experiences, organizations you've worked with. Uh, also ask your employer, your parents' employers, even grandparents' employers, see if they do scholarships. The worst they'll say is no. Maybe they'll say, sure, uh, $1,000 as long as they get at least Bs. And then that, you know, something to work towards. Um, yeah, so what else would you say, Melissa? Utility companies, churches, um, don't, don't overlook anything. I'm a, a, ask the question. Um, the other thing I'd say about scholarships is keep a working Word document of all the questions that you're asked so that you have those because usually most scholarships ask the same questions. So you just keep your answers and then you can just um, continue to grow them, make them better. Um, and um, just because you maybe don't get a scholarship this year doesn't mean you shouldn't continue to apply for scholarships your sophomore year, your junior year, and your senior year um, because um, that's, that's how you actually will receive a scholarship. I had a, a student this year that had more scholarships than the cost of attendance and I asked his mom actually how that happened and she said I made him apply for a scholarship every week. She took full credit. Um, and so my advice to you is um, it's, it's probably better than, you know, a job. If you can take it upon yourself to apply for a scholarship a week, your chances of receiving scholarships are that much greater. So take some time, um, create that scholarship um, Word document and keep track of deadlines because the worst thing, easiest way to miss a scholarship is to miss the deadline. So that's what I have to say about scholarships. And we're going to go on to the next question and that is what should we do if we've received an email stating our FAFSA has been processed by the school but we have not yet to receive it but we have yet to receive an email or packet through the mail about our financial aid statement good question uh, I would first take a look at your uh, to-do list your task list to see if there's anything that we're looking uh, to confirm some students are selected for verification which is a process that we do all the time. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong on your, that you necessarily did anything wrong. We're required by the federal government just to verify some information. So whatever it's asking for, it might be 2019, like a tax transcript or ask you to log back into your FAFSA and use the data retrieval tool. Um, just complete the task that is asked for there, send in the information as soon as you're able to so we can verify you and get you on the list to be packaged for financial aid. Uh, if you're sending in information to our office, anything that's secure, uh, like social security numbers, we do not recommend emailing it to our office because uh, email is not a very secure method of transferring that. Uh, postal mail is better, um, best and most quickly would be faxing it to our office. Good. Um, I have nothing to add to that. So we'll go on to the next question. And that is, if I get scholarships in the future and tell the school, what will they, cha cha what will they change based on that information? Great. Uh, so if you remember that cost of attendance at $19,386, we can only offer financial aid 
up to that amount. And that's another reason why that number is so important and why it's kind of a, a, a generous large number is that we can offer financial aid to help cover those things. So what'll happen is we'll add your scholarship onto your financial aid offer and we may have to reduce another kind of financial aid in order to keep you within budget. And so what we would do is we would take away the least desirable type of aid first. And in most cases, that's like an unsubsidized loan, the kind of loan that you're being charged interest on, we may have to reduce part of that to keep you within budget. The only thing I'd add to that is we will never take away your Pell Grant. If you have a Pell Grant on your account, that's based on, um, that's an entitlement program. So if you meet the criteria for a Pell Grant, you could have $50,000 worth of scholarships and you're still going to get your Pell Grant. Okay. Um, if you have scholarships from your school that are for a specific major, does it hurt to apply for it even if you aren't going for that specific major? I guess it probably depends on how many other students are applying for that specific scholarship. If your schol if your major is similar and maybe because the school you're going to doesn't have that exact major, but you're going into that field, I say go for it. You know, uh, you might be the only person who applies for it, or you might be the best candidate uh, that is close to fulfilling all the requirements. Thank you. Um, does accepting work study limit you to only working one work study job and no other paid work? You can work more than one job on campus, but there is a limit to how many hours students are allowed to work while class is in schedule. Uh, I believe that's 25 hours, is that right, Michaela? Yep, so uh, because school is that important, uh, we have a 25 hour limit while school's in session for students to be working. Uh, during spring break, winter break, times like that, you can work more hours. Uh, but there is a finite amount of work study funds available per student. Um, many jobs on campus will let you switch over to non work study money once you've used up all your work study. But if you're working in an office or somewhere on campus that only has work study positions, uh, once you use up all those all those hours all the time, um, all the funds, then you're you're out of a job for that that specific office. Uh, but you could apply then for a job somewhere else for non work study. Funds. Okay. Um, what's the best way to contact the financial aid office? So I'm going to bring up our contact information again on the screen here. Share screen, this one. Okay. So we have the Office of Financial Aid and Scholarships. We have a phone number 715-346-4771. We are staffed uh, 7.45 a.m. till 4.30 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, outside of those times, you can leave a voicemail. Uh, you can also leave a voicemail if, if we're all busy taking phone calls. Sometimes it happens that you're calling at the exact same time as six other students or six other families, um, leave a voicemail and we'll get back to you as soon as we're able to. We, we shoot for less than one business day, but it, it gets really busy sometimes, or if you have a question that needs some research. Um, otherwise, we also have our general email account, the FIN for financial, uh, finaid at uwsp.edu. Uh, and again, though that might get forwarded on to somebody else for somebody to look into something. We try to respond within one or two business days, depending on what kind of question it is, uh, so that you can be helped as, as soon as possible and get your, your questions answered. Uh, and honestly, talking to families, students, parents on the phone is one of my favorite parts of my job, is getting to kind of know students on a almost personal level. It's not the same as when we had walk-ins and could meet face-to-face, -face, but I, I like helping students and answering questions. And I always say at the end of my call, if anything we talked about doesn't make sense later, call again, we're happy to explain it a different way. And, and, and that's what I really love about, about financial aid here is that um, we, we're more than willing to help one another and, and answer questions multiple times because it is hard, it is weird. Money can be hard and weird, um, but we're here to help you make sense of it and help you uh, be successful in college. And money can be emotional. Um, so a lot of times if you need to reach out to us and you wanna to talk to us even in, in person during this, this time, we could do it via Zoom. Um, so you still have that personal feel and um, we're here to serve you however you need. Um, we're, we're 
our goal is to make your dreams become a reality. So don't be afraid to, to reach out, out to us. You may not be assigned an advisor like you are in the academic side, but um, you have a whole team of, of advisors and you can touch any of us, tap any of our shoulders and we're here to serve you. Um, I have another question though. Um, are they accepting applications for jobs for the fall now? I don't know. That's a good question. Michaela, do you have an answer to that? I do. So once you, we have an online job database called Quest. It's Q-U-E-S-T. Um, so once you enroll in courses and you're a student here, you actually get access to view all of the on-campus jobs. Local businesses will add them on there. Um, and it's a job searching database that you can utilize. You can search it by work study. Um, there's different items to that as well. So you can see if there's some posted. I know like our office will typically maybe post them. Um, but currently, right now, we're probably focusing on that spring semester since we're still in an academic term. Um, but I know we plan on posting as soon as February, and that's coming up quick. Um, so those are some elements to be considering as well. It just depends on the nature of the office. If you're interested in a job, I always recommend students to just ask. Um, I was actually appointed a job when I came to Stevens Point. I didn't actually officially apply to it. Um, it was from the communication that I had, networks that I built up, um, and people just talking about employment as well. So feel free to ask ask a certain office. I know residential living does like front desk people, um, financial aid office does things. Um, so a lot of people are having those employments um, or they'll save your name and add you in an email when they do send that job posting in the future is a way that I recommend as well. Right. And early bird gets the worm. So if you want a job, don't be afraid to reach out. If you, if you have a certain career goal and you know that there's a job on campus that's going to help you develop the career skills that you need, don't be afraid to reach out to that department right now and say, hey, I'm going to be a freshman in the fall and I'm seriously looking forward to working with you and, and find out what they need if they need a, a resume or whatever it is, an application that they have in their department to complete. Um, ask the questions. If you're, if you're not the early bird, that you're not going to get that worm, so go after it. Um, that's all that we have for questions. If I haven't addressed someone's questions, please tell me. Um, I'll say I don't see any other in the chat. I was making notes and crossing off which ones we've answered. So I think we're good. Um, unless if Katie and Melissa have anything else to add, I'll wrap up the conversation. I really don't have anything else to add. All righty. Well, thank you not only to our presenters, but all of you for joining us today. Um, I hope it was beneficial as I promised. Um, but like I said, I'll follow up with an email to all of you and that's going to include um, the recordings for any past webinars that we've had as well as a registration to future ones. Um, I really want to highlight if you are a first year student um, who's coming into the fall term, um, I put in a form on here where you can basically say that you attended this webinar um, where you can actually go in for a drawing. So there's only 27 people that have come in. Um, so pretty good odds. And ultimately by filling that form, you'll be able to go into a drawing for a scholarship of $250. Um, so that's another bonus. I also wanted to add to shameless plug for our office. We do have an admitted students day coming up. We have three events. So February 15th, the 27th of February, as well as March 5th. Um, and so those are both in person and virtual options. So if you're an admitted student, those are great opportunities to connect with our office. With our university, there will be faculty and staff. Fac um, they'll be doing um, sample classes, um, student testimonials to talk about the student experience, um, and all of those great things. By attending as well, um, we're going to be doing a drawing for scholarships, scholarships for each date um, for additional $250. So from that, you can get $500. Bucks. Um, so if you need help with that, I'll also send in how to sign up for those events as well in that registration or in that email. Um, but otherwise, I just wanted to say thank you once again um, and look forward to that follow-up email and we hope to see you again in the future webinars. So I think we'll stick around if anything else happens, but I know their office has great contacts. I call them all the time. They answer that phone. Um, so I really appreciate the work that they do. So otherwise, enjoy the rest of your Thursday night. Hopefully have dinner or go enjoy some Netflix. <laughs> Thank you, everyone.